I'm Seven Bomar, and I'm talking to Takula on Vibe M Radio. Here we are. Hey. Wholeness. Ooh, wholeness. We must be finally you know, working with our working with our time machine. You know what I mean? Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so glad we got a chance to get in here because man. I, for me too, on something like that, I'm like, cause I do the math. Like I literally sit there and I'd be like, okay, so it's cause Costa Rica is also in central standard time and mountain time. And we mm -hmm. switch when there's a daylight savings time. So I normally yeah. be on point, but I was like, are you kidding me? Cause no. I was actually, you know, prepping myself up for this today. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining. Once again, you are here with me, Takula Bay for another episode of talking to Takula and I am just so excited to have um, this individual join me here in my space. Um, he is the author of The Code of the Matrix. He is the creator of Secret Energy. He does a plethora of things, so just Google him. <laughs> but thank you so much, Mr. Seven Bomar, for sharing this space with me at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, you know, to just be with those who have been pioneering their own way through this and just sharing so much energy and force with so many unique beings you know it's really my pleasure to be here with you and to just be one of the people that that you came across and you know that that means a lot to me so thank you for inviting me on i, I am again honored um i know you have talked to many scholars and people that are so knowledgeable I, i'm a forever student and um you know, again, I have followed you. Actually, my mentor, my friend who has transitioned, Mr. Dr. Blair, um, mm. Delbert Blair, I, um, after he left, I just started searching and seeking. And that's how I came across to you. And I've been following you ever since then. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I actually manifested this moment because I said, I'm going to speak with him. I actually said I was coming to Costa Rica. So that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but I did say I need to speak with him. I need to connect with him. So I'm, I'm just elated for this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, got a, I'm glad we got a chance to even do this now. You know, these are very special times. You know, a lot of stuff is happening around us. And the more energy that we can continue to build with each other you know, yes. that's going to be because we, we know we knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know what it was going to feel like. So now we're in it and, you know, we're definitely just working more on actually having fun more on just changing the mood and changing the vibration and using what we have. Yes. yes. And, you know, and tapping back into our roots and seeing where, you know, happiness wasn't as complex for our ancestors, you know, as if we had each other. So, you know, bringing each other back online is key. Indeed. And, you know, and also, I, I find so many people already on point. So, you know, that's yeah, the thing. And, and a lot more coming. So, you know, I know that in one of your interviews, you talked about 2020 a lot. I saw you talking about the things coming in 2020. So here we are, 2020. Are. <laughs> and um, <laughs> what, what um, would you want to say about what's happening now in 2020? Although you talked about being prepared, but now we're here. Um, what do you want to tell everybody about what's currently taking place? Well, you know, I, I have a, I have jokes about 2020. I always say it's the gift that keeps giving oh and, God. you know, and, and something is, you know, going to happen and then something else. And it kind of gets us into, you know, the thrills and spills. And I'm not sure if my message really has changed in a tense to that 2020 is now upon us because I felt like in 20. 2009 when we began this that it was like a 2020 kind of critical thing because then it was 2012 yeah. and 2012 yeah. seemed to have a lot more credentials than 2020 it was like 2020 became what was next after we went through 2012 and the world wasn't over and we had to keep going and then 2020 became that next date yeah. and I was always saying as you know that you know this 2020 2012 thing can happen at any point in time and where I'm really at now, you know, because I love to just be on this experience where I'm looking to gain the best in life and then share that with others. Mm -hmm. And I'm really seeing how this energy is bringing of, you know, the essence of who we are. It's like, instead of seeing, it's all feeling right now. And this feeling has us like even being able to assess what it was like and what it should be like to be connected, to be with our ancestors, to not be worried about what's gonna happen when we die, to start making big moves here, you know, on all different levels to just see our fulfillment in this limited 72 year maximum or, or, or average lifespan. 
and and then really see, you know, also the huge plot of that distraction, distraction, distraction. Hey, pay attention to me. You know, hey, spend time with me. Is yeah. that it has always been at its all time high, and that has you know kind of come into to direct competition with how much it takes to really understand our existence, right? Like, I feel like we have a high maintenance existence. Like, even if you just start working on yourself, there's the cleansing, there's the eating the right things and then, you know, getting the right stuff on your skin and all of those different kinds of things to do. And then you may have, and so if you have anybody else in your life, you know, let alone if that's some kids or, or, or a significant other, mm -hmm. but a job and all this other stuff, it's just going to mean that you are by facts and not really have enough time to really dig into who you truly are. And so thus the last 30 years, 40 years, depending upon how the person is, most of that hasn't been spent with really learning themselves. So of course there hasn't been much progress because we're the ones that are going to see the progress for ourselves because, yeah. you know, if my eyes close, Yours don't, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> a little bit of responsibility that you have over you and what you're going to see for infinity. Right. So that that's what I'm up to now is I've gotten a, a lot of steam behind me and being able to really not only pioneer some new stuff that's going to solve these issues. Okay. And um, kind of like it's a good time because before when we were talking about this kind of stuff that was ten years ago you know, it had a certain kind of reception. It was really more like science fiction. People love to play with it a little bit, but it wasn't something that was really like, this is what's going to happen. Now things are a bit different, especially for a large percentage of those that we deal with and that come across, you know, our, our work and, and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's just more that they're like ready to get into, you know, this change. They're ready to like, they act like they know it. That's all I would always say. Now it's like, yeah. they've seen enough on it on social media and they got the lingo down. You know, so they got this woke kind of thing that they want to do. And now I feel like this is a great time for especially not only myself, but many of the pillars and the pioneers in this industry, as you mentioned, Blair, mm -hmm. you know, is able to actually show them and even live through these souls that need these beings more than ever right now. Yes, yes, yes. You know, as I was stating how I've, I've been going through this transformation, um, I've been getting more in tune with the etymology of things and words and Yes. Oh my gosh, even the sounds and it, it, it really has baffled me a lot. And I've also realized that all of the things that I learned, I don't even remember a lot of the stuff from school, like just basic things that I was taught. And I'm like, what is going on with me? I used to think, okay, I know I'm not dumb. Why do I, why did I forget this? I, I learned this in English. I learned this in history, but I feel that a lot of things were intentionally being removed because it wasn't true <laughs> for one. Mm. And so even with the sounds and words, um, why is it that we are using, or what would you say the explanation is about the words being used interchangeably and in, in the, 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 the meaning? Because so many people say, you know, it's not important what you call me, but I, I say, yeah, because what you're calling the name, that's what resonates. So to me, yeah. yeah, it does matter what you answer to. So if you can just talk about the words and, and the spellings and all of that. Sure, sure. You know, it's great that every time we, the deeper we get into this, it seems to get more simple. That's the good part. Cause there's a certain point as you're going into it, it's just getting more complex. Now there's more questions. And I am here to say that there is a point where you hit like this certain, like turning point, as they say, where mm -hmm. it now starts to roll itself back up and be more simple. Okay. And so it's good that I have that version now, because if you had a copy like five or 10 years ago, now we're going to go for about an hour <laughs> just on that. Nice. And it's that tones and vibrations, you know, what we call language, you know, played an extremely, extremely important role to the development of the consciousness overall. Okay. It's so deep that if we can say that our ancestors have been existing for thousands of years, if not ten th tens of thousands and even millions of years, if we inherited anything from them, it is language, spells, and tones and vibrations, basically to have this ability to utter and to emit, you know, because we even do this, there's, there's sub frequencies that we also emit and there's other forms of communication. Like we have sense that communicate, right? Like pheromones that communicate. So that whole ability of communication is something that we've inherited over billions of years of what you can say is evolution, mm -hmm. but really on a higher level with the development of how do you begin to experience an external existence. And we do that through language. So how it comes to us actually is it comes from the stars. 
Okay. It seems the pure evidence of that our parents were for sure from different spaces and time is because their most precious thing that they gave to us was actually patterns and charts in the sky. <laughs> and these patterns and charts in the sky are very functional for Earth. It's not just astrology, it's also astronomy and it's also nautics, meaning how stars move across the sky, that determines how currents move across the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, this governs travel, it governs migrations of certain species. You know, it gets all the way into personalities and temperaments. So everything, as they say, as above, so below is written in the sky and then also redundified on the surface and in the, in the deep. Okay. And so when we look at the sky, we say, well, whoever is so familiar with these stars has to be familiar with them because they have a relationship with them and they are even going there. So if I found a star map inside of a cave, this would be more than likely not just because somebody drew it from the sky, especially if they draw things that you can't even see in the sky. Mm -hmm. It's because they have some kind of way of getting there and know and knowledge that that, that is a place. Okay. And so going from there, because this master code is in the sky, it's like a disc. Like if you took like a snapshot of it, even especially when they do the time lapse of it, you literally would be looking at a record of our entire experience. Mm -hmm. And so there have, has been in the deeper sanctums of learning, a strong emphasis on learning this language, this tone vibration and being able to ordinate at least certain people to learn the power that comes from the star to gain the potential in order to be able to draw down the power. Now, what happened is, is that, so this knowledge obviously was in Kemet and it was in, you know, a few more places in the ancient Orient, this system. And that's why they're still relatively the same when you know what to look for today in linguistics. Okay. And what happened at a certain point is while this, this, language was not something that people were just given to learn a language and to be able to write it down was really even a series of things that happened in history one in which that it was said that none of the verbs and none of the things that we pronounce should ever be written down it was even a part of the culture then if you may uh, in this in the spirituality then to never write down any of this to always translate it from those who were custodians of it like the babas and those who could tell the stories and they would make sure these stories stayed intact never was changed the symbols can't be changed and so again they they really were against writing it down because that meant that another person would just have a, a reading a re, a, re, a literal interpretation they would just read it but if you weren't there with the baba and watching his face and watching how he was doing things and seeing what he was throwing out there as far as the symbols you wouldn't be able to completely interpret the power Right. of what was being bought forth. So that was always the concern. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, especially with the very strong trade routes inside of you know the areas that we even call Iran, Iraq today, Israel, Jerusalem, all these areas, there were major trade routes that were in these areas. And there was a need to actually create a universal form of communication that at least um, what you would say is some of the, some of the higher ranking courtiers could use in other tribes and other places that they went to in, in communication with other high ranking ambassadors to continue this trading process. So it was quickly decided when witnessing that this language was present inside of these temples amongst these priests to actually use this language for its most gross format, which was counting. Okay. So the first real use of language came actually as a way of counting and then more importantly, counting things for commerce. Mm. That's basically the first desecration of the ancient power of spelling and knowledge and tones and vibrations was to use it for something as base as uh, a financial transaction. And also because the ancient knowledge was being used, because ancient knowledge was embedded within the language, it was still something that if you went even over into the Celtic areas, you know, they were... They were even black. If you communicate with them with what with the language that was actually being spoken, Kemet, and you can also ride out to Japan and communicate with them with that same language because the language was actually a star chart. And the knowledge of the stars and the energy that was coming off of those stars, you couldn't like ad lib on that and change that. Mm -hmm. So what you actually saw next was is you saw certain cultures begin to change around specific letters. Mm 
this was very instrumental in even just changing the whole way people's mind function. Uh, even as we went in the Bible, the king, look, when we look in the Bible, the key agent that is being used by the author of the confusion, not the, the one who doesn't like the author, the one who doesn't like confusion being the author of confusion uses language to confuse. Yeah. And, and that's a big thing when, it, when you really understand that scenario there. And when it says that everyone was together as if they spoke one tongue, even the beasts mm -hmm. and the animals. And what that actually is a reference to is not that just animals were over there talking and we were communicating with them. But it was that we understood where the bear was really from, where the giraffe was really from and what their energies really were and how they connected in with us as totems and how even certain parts of their body was used in order to formulate us. Now, some people may take that too far and say, oh, okay, so we're we doing that in a laboratory or whatever, but it's as simple as when people are in a certain, you know, in your culture, culture is a Petri dish. In, in, in a culture, you're going to eat things from the culture in order to grow up. So all of the fruits, all the plants, all the flowers, all the pollen, everything, because that's all something we're being exposed to in an environment, even if we're not eating it, will become the makeup of the people that it was the the material that the people were actually made of so they knew what they were made of and they in that part of them they could call forth and then that did give them a really strong kinship with many different animals and and many different energies that were moving around so this now has come across as some type of fancified magic but it is very precise it is precise as my ad these are real uh, there are real numbers in it as we know my ad is math there are real frequencies frequency correspondences in it so it's not so much as a hocus pocus and you know we come in with a with the long robe and the, and all of this mm -hmm. it's a real precise we know what we're getting when we manifest certain things and when we put certain formulas together so to also just answer your question that means then if we're using the language haphazardly mm -hmm. because imagine so now the codes changing a little bit and now the codes which are still codes and words of power mm -hmm. it's being changed a little bit but it has many of its core as he has always been B. Generally the first nine letters of a language are all the same. And then generally it'll try to hold until you get to like the 21st letter before it starts to really deviate. Okay. And what I've been able to study is that this deviations and these deviations within the positions of letters are in fact creating different journeys for people who are using the programs of language. And um you know, all the ultimate destiny of those journeys is still in question at times, but we can also see that you can never reinvent the wheel. And, and that actually, that term really comes from 360 degrees. That language was referred to as a cabal. The cabal is also the root word is cable. A cable is something that has a connection from the beginning to the end, making a circle. This uh, is saying that A is supposed to connect to Z and it makes a, it's supposed to make a perfect circle. And that perfect circle is supposed to be the layout of the cosmos and the sky, which is the disk. And if there's nothing new under the sun, then you can predict the future from knowing the complete, you know, the, the procession as it's called, the procession of the disk. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody moves those things around and puts, you know, this, this one over here and this one over here, mm -hmm. this in fact causes confusion within the mind. So it's almost like things that should have ended still keep going. Mm -hmm. Things that shouldn't be happening are actually happening. And this just comes in, you know, tampering with the master code. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, Mayat and numerology, um, I see so many sequence of numbers throughout the day. And I feel that it's a communication. Can you explain the sequence of numbers that we often see most, some of us all day, <laughs> such as myself? Absolutely. You know, I like to really deal with numbers. Um, how could I play? How could I, how can I explain it? So it's like, sometimes you go open a book mm -hmm. and if you really trust that book, you go right to whatever you're reading right away. And it's going to tell you everything you need to know. And then you close the book. Right. And you don't open the book again and you don't keep doing this because mm -hmm. you kind of like wear out the magic or whatever. <laughs> right. So it's kind of like the eight ball. You like flip it over and you take a look and then it'll tell you everything. Numbers are really like that. And it's because, it, yes, behind the fabric of the reality, why some understand numbers only as logic for math. Numbers are for sure symbols. Yeah. Uh, like, for instance, uh, if you notice the number two is a swan. Right. And it's always been a swan and it connects with a lot of different things. But you notice even the number still bears the actual physical representation of what it is. And so 
when we know these codes, which I actually had really, really went in on, on uh, we, have a, we have a mentorship that we do. So I, I went in on a course just about the first nine letters, which are called the, the language of the sky. So it talks about basically how the world is divided within 21 letters. And then there's a hidden letter and that's like the 22 letters. And this is why you always see 22 as a part of tarot and a part of, you know, Hebrew and even Arabic. And, you know, basically it, it's a direct reference to that. It's a nine, then a nine and, or excuse me, it's like a nine, which is then 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 4, 25, 26, 27. Okay, so then 22, 22 and three. So it's basically the, the division of 21 divided by three Okay. is the divisions of the earth okay. and or in the so it's the sky the earth and then the nether, nether world and so if you know the first nine letters or symbols if you may do you know how to communicate with the sky and that's what was taught first and then the next nine letters are for you to basically be able to comprehend the terrestrial sphere and then the final nine letters is for you to be able to communicate with the afterlife or what some would be call, called called the dead. Okay. And also those same symbols play out in the sky, even based on the horizon of the sun and the energies that actually come through in the movement of those characters are also the gestation process for an entire soul, mm -hmm. starting from the beginning, coming from what is Taurus, you know, that is the Arak, which is the, the A symbol turned upside down, which is the, the head of a calf or a, the head of a bull, mm -hmm. all the way down to the final part, which is the Z uh, in an English language. This is actually a serpent. But, you know, if you go to ancient Kemet, we find that this actual first letter is, is, a, is a bird. It's actually an eagle and so or a hawk. And so it's, it's like what we find is, is that these are programs or codes that many of them have such a deep, such a deep coding and connection that if you loaded them, you would experience life on the same level as how the ancestors were experiencing life. It was like what we call surreal when something's just so real. It's like back in the, those days, you, they were working with, they worked with it. So it's like when you talk about going through death and you talk about going into afterlife and dealing with certain entities, like this was like every day, like we go out for what we do every day. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's quite interesting how now, again, the, this power that we have is being used for something so rudimentary, but you can also see why if we got 8 billion, 9 billion people in the world, why that would be also the case, because mm -hmm. what would happen if we put this knowledge in the heads of 9 billion people and they could actually use it mm -hmm. and they didn't have all of the rest of the tutelage that it takes to be even responsible for dealing with such levels of power. I heard you talking about the future and we're in the past. If you can explain to those that missed it exactly what you meant by we are right now in the past. Sure. So in the language, it, it has a lot of stuff to actually tell. The, the letters are not just there as like inanimate objects. They actually are telling a story. Okay. And a part of that story is actually hidden within the English word backwards. Mm, okay. And it says directly that the words are backwards. Mm. Because of the direction that this code is running and has been running for a while, it actually has the effect of turning everything not only upside down, but in the opposite direction. It would, in effect, after at least a few hundred years of its use, mm -hmm. start allowing you to go back through things that you've already experienced because you're changing the direction of your brain. Mm -hmm. So time you know is, is a very strange thing because it can actually even move based on the consciousness so even the consciousness can be all over the place the consciousness of the time machine the consciousness can be in the past thinking about stuff that just happened to them a while ago it could be in the present and it can also be in the future so that goes further than just that that statement okay. it also allows you to be able to use your being as a time traveler to enter into certain spaces and modes. Now, here's what's also interesting. All the times are happening right now mm. because times are also frequencies and because frequent, all the frequencies are actually here in the spectrum right now, then all time can be accessed right now. So this means that I can still be 2000 years in the future and standing here right next to you mm. in, relatively, in relativity. The resonance 
may be something that needs to be readjusted. But as far as the physical presence, that's not really the benchmarker to determine where we're at in time. So you do have some folks that are literally prehistoric right mm -hmm. now, walking here amongst some beings that are really from what we would perceive as the future. But what we agree on, and that's called the co-creative time space, that's like where we're all at right now. And when you learn how to play with that, that means you don't need to accept that what right, you don't have to accept what right now is. You accept right now as like a pin on the map. Mm -hmm. And then you get a chance to navigate to other places. And then when you're ready, you can come actually back to the right now. Also, can I get with you right there for a moment when you said mm -hmm. that there are frequencies here right now? Would mm -hmm. that be the same? Um, I, I often have told many people in the past few months that there's, a lot of different energies and entities that I feel are present in this moment. So mm -hmm. would you say that that's the same? Are, are we referring to the same thing when you say that the frequencies are here now? Yeah, well, this is why 2012 was such a central concept, if you really understand what was being brought forth. Not so much as the day and the time, but just the awareness that there was like a 12 o'clock for everything, that there was a certain point where even frequencies that weren't even close together like orbits, all of a sudden they all line up at a certain point or there's points where they get closer and it's like a pipeline. All of a sudden this pipeline opens and then all the energies can choose to move from one space to another. So for sure 2012 is one of those pipelines. And so we do have energies here that we can even feel for those of us that are sensitive that are foreign to the atmosphere. They're, they're, it's foreign to the space and it's trying to adapt to the space. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they haven't always been here. It's that they haven't always been able to get in here, if that makes sense. Mm. And because it's also time to that when there, we would also come to a certain level of, of, of spiritual, mental, and physical awareness that would allow that to be another catalyst for us to get to the next stage of our awareness in the university, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really one of those things where we have relative, in, we have energies that are becoming more relative because the films between our world and their world, if you may, or our spectrum and their spectrum, are, the film is starting to wear thin. Okay. And now you have resonators here because that's what is kind of sent first is like a resonator, something, it's like a seed. Mm -hmm. The seed can actually be inserted into the reality much more easier than the whole form. Just like for a child, a child does not go into the mother's womb and it's already big. And it cannot come out of the mother's room as a complete adult. So this is that whole process that first, it, it's like, a, it's like a, an insemination, if you may. And then the frequency resonators become present. And so a lot of these resonations, which we've been watching, which is, you know, kicking off in these other worlds that we're not paying attention to, like uh, the video games, the zombie games, you know, the, the, the different levels of how a lot of the, the smaller children are being used as processors in order to create to be resonators to allow that kind of energy to start becoming resident uh, in the space. Yeah. And so, you know, this is, you know, I'm sure we're, we're speaking on the same thing here when we talk about how certain energies are around that, you know, don't even feel, they feel alien mm. uh, in that respect because they're not really adapted to the space yet. Understood, understood. We yeah. often say that this place is an illusion and we are the creators of everything that mm. has taken place. Um, so if that, if that be true, um, what would you say, or how would you explain then, um, if this is not a reality, um, the things that people endure, the good and the bad, can you kind of explain then what it is that we're supposed to be doing if we are in fact creating this false reality or illusion or whatever you would like to call it? Sure. I mean, what we're, what we're supposed to be doing is that we're supposed to be exploring, just to answer that question directly. <laughs> okay. The divine masculine side of us, as we mentioned, is the explorer. And then there's a divine feminine side of ourselves, which is what we're exploring. And, you know, to be, to be very clear, wh where this misinterpretation is coming, on, coming from is actually the definition of illusion. Hmm. We've defined illusion as something that is, is not real. It's, it's basically... Uh, gastrous. It's like if you put your hand through it and, and it just goes right through. Right. And where this came from, because, you know, studying etymology, you learn what is an, what is an illu, because an illu is actually a very, very 
uh, important word in the ancient times, the L's and the ills and the owls and the O's and the O's. All of those were certain, a rank of certain types of, of, of beings. So when we say, well, what is an illusion? The word illu refers to light and more specifically a full spectrum field of light, nine colors, okay? Black and white being one of those colors as we understand it. And when, when you're in an illusion, you're basically in, uh, as you see the word S-I-O-N is also on the back of the word mansion. Ooh, okay. And you know, you can stay in a mansion. So that S-I-O-N is also the reference to a Zion. A Zion is also known as a mainframe, an actual, like they call it the city of Zion. It's an actual, it's a place, mm -hmm. but it's created from, if it's an illusion, a place that you can stay that's made of light. So there wasn't really any mention towards, and you didn't, and you shouldn't take it serious and it's not really real. And that's what everyone added to that in their own definition, but that's not what it means. It just means that this place is made, the higher levels of laws, as I said, the laws from the sky are, are laws of light. Mm -hmm. These laws have to do with things that it can't be broken anyway. It's like the same reason why if I pour certain chemicals together, it explodes. If I've been an arc in a roof a certain way, the sound echoes a certain way. So there's like these hard coded principles inside of the space even sometimes they could feel like even cheat codes if you know what certain things that you can do. And that is the actual coding of the construct. And that coding is in light. And so the language of light is the most powerful language that you could actually learn. It actually harkens back to the stars because those are the lights. Mm -hmm. So the illusionary field is only a reference again to a space that is being created using those powers. And it has nothing to do with whether or not it should be taken serious or not. And that it's really not real or any of the things that have come on, come after that uh, recollection by others, you know, creating the wrong definition for the word illusion. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about being sovereign. Um, is it possible to be sovereign and kind of coexist in this system or work in this system or participate in this system as well? I believe so personally. I mean, I have my own opinions about many things because I can't be defeated. Like I won't be defeated in my mind, like never on my own battlefield in my territory, which is my consciousness, can I be overrun? So I would never insist that there was something that I cannot do. I would not lock myself out like that. I've done that before in life, dealing with other people's limitations and just kind of totally see how I call it straight. They'll straight jacket you. They'll kind of get you into a position where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't and you just don't know what to do so you don't do anything mm -hmm. and you know you'll watch all of a lot of beings around you kind of stuck in this comatose phase because they can't get over and adapt to what comes next and you know i learned this kind of thing when dealing with you know psychoactive substances because they have a they have they're like fuel supplies for the soul they don't last indefinitely but they will give you a very strong glimpse for a while of what it's like to be a completely charged up human and you know in this process you know, you, you just kind of learn that. Wow, it's just, it, well, first thing you learn is that, you know, just like when I make that statement, it's not out of conceit. It's like a fact, you know, how much you can ex begin to accept and then that becomes a part of your life. Mm -hmm. And that, that you're actually writing the entire projection once you take the wheel of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just right now, we haven't been doing that. <laughs> so it seems like, you know, it just kind of seems like some of these things are far fetched, but like in the lucid dream, for instance, in this field, you're calling up and you're creating whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And if you can do this every night, you can imagine how that starts to wear on you as you keep coming back to the world every day where you can't, you don't do that. You start seeing things bleed over. Actually, you, you learn how the dream can control this reality. Your dream body is seven times stronger than your body that's in this reality. So when you start working with the dream, you can actually get things to bleed over from the dream into this reality. Mm -hmm. And then because the dream is more superior from a, from a time level, you can actually see tomorrow from the dream. Mm -hmm. So the dream starts to become the control point. And when you start, when you start, when you start creating in the dream, 
you realize that this is the same thing that's going to happen when you die, except for this time, you're not going to wake back up into a reality. You're going to stay in that field where you can call up everything. Mm. So I, I do feel like personally, one of the big goals in life, and people start doing this a lot when they actually become, when they get older, it's like you start lucid dreaming naturally, but you just don't realize that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Especially as the, the body starts letting go more, the body is called the, we call it Lord Governor. It has like a symbol of a pentagram and it, it holds in or cages or closes your chakras so that they don't, you know, cause if they go hot, I mean, <laughs> if this stuff turns all the way on, there's no more of you evaporate in this whole thing. And so there's a, a container, mm -hmm. if you may, that mm -hmm. you're put into. And, and people saw that also as a governor, cause you can see that it's kind of like still restricting and confining an energy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in this process, you know, you, you basically begin to learn how to come outside of this shell, mm -hmm. which is what our ancestors were doing, how to venture out of this. And earth is a bit, is key and instrumental to you now when you're able to project your own reality to actually being able to determine what you want to project. So you want a chair, you get a chair. If you want it all made of fur, it's all made of fur. If you want to fly with these, these, alpha, these, these, these eagles, you fly. Now you even know what flying is. There's so many little different micro pieces of awareness inside of this reality. If you can take that back to your own treasure house, which is your imagination or lucid dream, you can then build everything there. So that's why, you know, people thought that they couldn't leave here with anything. It's just not in the way that we think you can't, you do leave here with everything because you can call all of that back up right from what people think is the dream when you get into the other space. So that answers your question. And so what is the goal in life? Mm. The goal in life is to live lucid, mm. is to actually realize are the magic that you're ignoring and everybody has it. Like yeah. there's generally not one person that doesn't dream. Now, whether you can remember it and you have control over it, those are other matters, but it shows <laughs> you already, you have the projector and you have the eye. That's why they run around with this eye all the time. That's the eye they're referring to is this one that allows you to be able to peer into the lenses of life. Mm. And, you know, you time travel, you go all up into other people's mind. You could talk to people that are dead. You could do all sorts of stuff. Like I can amass thousands of years worth of knowledge from books that are not even written in languages we've ever seen before, all in within 30 minutes and come up out <laughs> of the sleep like. Oh my God. Then the weird part is, here's the weird part, because that sounds all fine and nanny, but when you come over here, there's this crossover of the data. That's the easiest way to put it. Mm. And the richness of the code being used in the spaces that you're going in the dream is so strong that when it tries to pass through this pipeline of this world, it gets lost like a filter. And that it gets like filtered out. And that's why most people forget their dreams because it's like, it's in a different language. It's in a different code. Now, once you realize that, you can start working on how to bring your dreams over into this reality through other mediums, like water. Water has this ability to, like if you put a cup of water on the side of your bed, especially if it's like spring water, something that is a little mineralized, and you go to sleep, and then when you wake up in the morning, you drink that water and you keep doing that consistently, you'll notice that you'll have more dream recollection and dream retention. Because when you're asleep, all of this stuff unpacks. Like I've had the opportunity to actually see it a couple times, especially when you start training your body to, your body thinks you're asleep, which is kind of wild because your body functions almost like a parent. Mm -hmm. And it thinks that you're in the room sleep. And so now it's going to do the parent thing. And then you're, you could be there kind of watching it. Mm -hmm. And when you watch it, you watch the chakras unpack literally and start basically like, they're like geometric cogs of kaleidoscopes that actually the kaleidoscope design is the thing that you're seeing and experiencing in the dream. May I? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, no, I, I may have over answered I, the question. <laughs> I, I got a little chill there because you kind of just went right in my head. So dreams. Um, oh my gosh. I, I call them visions, whatever. Dr. Blair used to explain to me of, of it being like a pyramid. And um, when you're going through that space and you go out and when you're astral traveling, so to speak, and you go from the top and then you have to come back down to get into your body. And and this recently happens to me actually a couple of times when you're traveling back down to enter your body in that spirit realm, 
um, sometimes people get stuck in between. Um, and just to piggyback off of that, I was in a space where I could see my body laying there, but it was just a quietness. So mm -hmm. I was there and I had to do this thing that I won't mention here to make myself go back into my body. Yes. So I'm only mentioning that to say, so I'm sure maybe there are other people that have had this experience. Is there something you should or shouldn't be doing? Because when you're traveling, there are other places that you might visit other entities that are not so good. And then you may bring those entities back here, possibly. Is that correct as well? So can you talk about how do we control that so that we're not bringing the wrong things back or how to actually, you know, m maneuver or travel back and forth seamlessly without issues? Yeah, well, you know, I, I let my guides handle that. And when, and when I'm talking about guides, I'm saying my ancestors, my higher self, you know, when it gets, when it starts to get complicated, okay. uh, like especially with dealing with external forces or potentially external forces in other forms that may be trying to interfere, there's absolutely no way I could have gotten as far as I've gotten at this point, especially with some of the beings that I've had to deal with, with that being my personal responsibility, because everything has to, everything has this checkpoint. Like um, even when we look at certain systems, like we've been really looking at the system of the nine, which is the Enneagram, also Enneology and the entities from uh, Kemet are also in a nine, Teth Newton, all of the, the, the pantheon that is there is nine, but they're not, if you want to say superior, they're not more superior than the four elements. So it's kind of like when the four elements come in, it's like, that's what created the nine. So it's like, there's now you're not, the nine's power is kind of like irrelevant at that point. Okay. And then so too, the four has another power, like within the zero, that it has to say, yeah, you know, still, you know, zero's <laughs> coming. <up. laughs> Let me get out of here. And so there is this hierarchy, if you may, that exists within the order of magnitude. That's why our ancestors always talk about the order a lot. So I let the order handle, you know, these kind of transactions and where I'm going and who's there and who I may be invited back and all that kind of stuff, because I don't I don't believe that that should be comprehended by that the human being, what, meaning that those kind of things shouldn't be set in the consciousness, like we shouldn't have to worry about something next since we created everything right mm -hmm. now there is astral hygiene, though, because I have a course specifically, and we talked a long time about astral hygiene because I did notice, you know, with all that, what I just said, that if you go in certain places, mm -hmm. you're now going to experience what's really in that place. And there's kind of no way of really preventing that. So even going to sleep at certain people's house, I used to have to take what I call the dream kit which was something that I literally needed to kind of configure my space that I was going to go to sleep. So when I did meld into what was there, because that's going to happen, it's just like I said, with certain substances, they're like literally where you can use it and you'll see everything in the environment. And it'll t and, and, and in about 10 minutes, it'll all shut off again. So when you have had those experiences, and again, I'm not saying that that's the only way I learned to, get, to cross over through breathing. Mm. But then there's what I call the businessman's version. This means that I don't have time to take a thousand breaths. I need to actually see what is in the space. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in the, in the booth real quick like Superman. I'm going to come back out and I'm going to be on something. Mm -hmm. And y'all just need to sit down over there and don't look weird because that's going to make me paranoid of who you are too. Okay. And I'm going to take a look. And then when you come out, your third eye will be open so you can see certain things like things that have been done there, things that are still there certain kind of energies. And you just notice that, especially certain places like the bathrooms mm. and, you know, places where people have, other people have been and you don't even know who those people are. There's a lot of stuff there. So yeah. that's why your temple is really, you know, your great place, you know, per Ankh, it's like your, your best place is to really start fortifying just your house and, you know, get the Palo Santos in, get the sage, do a corner to corner, like know that, you know, when you're moving through your house and you're moving energy out because energy just needs to go into the place that it belongs to. There's no energies that are really uh, 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 what we would say is good or bad. There's energies that are out of place. Mm. And so if you can't put an energy in this place, then it could be out of place and that's going to cause uh, it, imbalance in the atmosphere. So when we come in and we do a corner to corner, that just means to get some Palo Santo and some sage, light that thing and start walking around the house and hit the corners because with your intentions, which your field is huge. 
like the field is so large. I, I would, when another person is next to another person, especially a woman, it's very difficult not to be enveloped by their field because of how large the field is anyway. Mm -hmm. So when you come, when you're coming in with intention, that intention's in your field and you start moving through your house, it's like that big brush on the car wash. Mm -hmm. And then all you have to make sure you do is that you don't miss a corner because I can guarantee you that's where they're all at. Even some people use a technique of just keeping spirits in one corner of their house. They don't even soak that corner. They'll leave, they'll run them all into that corner and they'll leave them all there. Uh, and this is a part of feng shui actually, because it talks about how, especially as a powerful person, there's almost like a council that is always around you of a spectrum of beings that you're constantly through the maturity that you've learned keeping them in check. They're almost like kids, but they're also like, they're in the tutelage learning from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and this is how energies work because we, all, we, we have thousands of years worth of spiritual connections all residing within our being right now, all looking to also themselves act out in some way, shape or form in our existence as something, even if that's as your cup, <laughs> right. even if that's as your pet or like your dog or your cat, or you know, even as a tear running down your face. So that's what we learn about the elements is that the elements are really actually the forces that are back there that have personalities as we understand personalities that are operating through all of these forms that we're looking at around us. And even though we shaped it like, I don't know, even a plastic lid on a, on a container, mm -hmm. this is still coming from a source that has an energy moving through it that is also participating in this session, but can you communicate? And this is where that language again starts becoming key and fundamental. The next nine letters about communicating with things on the terrestrial plane mm -hmm. and the language that they speak. And it's not that you're gonna be in this room chanting off the radio. It's actually, it's an intonation. It's something that you learn internally you even recite internally and it starts turning the wheels in your consciousness to allow you to begin to feel how you need to be in order to comprehend and connect with those kind of elements. So it's not a say these words and the thing's going to float. That's all Hollywood and Disney world. It's all about, well, what does this element, how does this element communicate? And then you can feel into its form of communication. And most importantly then is purpose because none of this stuff can literally generally be done with someone that's just kind of haphazardly doing it like they're going to juggle with it. Mm -hmm. Anytime this stuff was being used, it was because there was something major really happening and someone needed to use the power in order to bring something forth that was going to be a solution or it could be the problem. That's the other thing. Not everybody that knows this knowledge, as I keep mentioning to people, are great, good, amazing people. Right. Because sometimes this knowledge, because the DNA is like a roulette table sometimes, this knowledge will birth itself through beings that we, we would think they shouldn't have that power, but somehow one of them can actually be born with it and then we're dealing with that. So it's important that if any of us have any potential powers and abilities and awareness of self, that we fully maximize that potential because it takes thousands of years to cultivate something like that. Mm -hmm. And if you see like this life that if you've had beings come across your path that have a great deal of awareness and knowledge and they always want to impart those knowledge and gems on you and you always find yourself in that arena, that mm -hmm. means that you have a pass. And we always say in this world that you should use your pass, mm -hmm. meaning that if for some reason you find that there is some spiritual phenomena going on around you and there is, there is, a, there is a force and all knowing that is calling you into truth, then your number is being called because that's not how everybody, it, that's not what everybody has going on. And the more and more you dig into this, you figure out why also, because everything is bound within time. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean it's not eventually going to happen for them. It just doesn't, it just means it's not going to happen right now. Mm -hmm. And time is really what creates the chosen. It's not really something that somebody is saying, this is who I am because I was born here or, because this is where my land is or whatever. It's that when you come to a certain level of awareness, now your number is being caught. Then I just wouldn't gamble with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't blow a whole life where you have a certain level of awareness and expecting that you're gonna come back again and you're gonna start off where you left off. Mm -hmm. It's best to just go ahead and finish the whole thing 
uh, and, and get and go ahead and make it on after that if you can reach that state of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. What about when, you know, as children growing up, you're kind of taught to be afraid of the dark or kids are always afraid of the dark and then you grow up to be this adult that don't want to sleep with the lights off, you know? Everyone has to have a night light or, you know, everything that goes bump in the dark or outside is all this fear of darkness. Yes. Why did they create this fear into us to fear darkness when we know we shouldn't? Okay, that, that's a really great question. This actually stems in the root to mysticism. It's, there was a way that we used to be that we take the step and then it appears. We were like a saying it is kind of people. Mm -hmm. Like we had mysticism or magic purveying everything that we did first. Mm -hmm. And so what this led to is, is that we didn't have a fear of the unknown. We, cre we actually created the unknown. Uh, the unknown is nothing. That's why it's not known. Right. So we had a way of taking the unknown and making it into something. So we were literally walking into the darkness or walking into the deep and then coming forward into what we had created called day. And so this had to be dismembered by all the objectives and all the agendas that we've been through thus far because it is the governor in itself. Fear is the governor. It's fire. It's the necessity to be able to still be able to rein back in the being, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Control, add some pain, add some punishment, add some fear to kind of like keep control. Now, when that, those powers were being used, they were being used responsibly and conservatively to, to basically to, to mold even your child, it's like when you spank your child, you're putting a fire on them, you're putting a fear on them. So if you do too much of that, though, you, you can damage their pride, too. So there's a certain amount of that. So what the, what the society has been doing is they use, they've been using for hundreds of years only that force. Mm -hmm. And so now we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid to walk in the dark. Mm -hmm. So how I say that you can begin this process, and, you know, this is a lot of us, of us experiencing this. I've gone through these experiences in different ways. I find that it also connects to deep water, too. I found that there was an extreme connection between the fear of the dark and the deep of the ocean. So when I would go out there and, you know, I would have, you know, you're not, I'm not going to die technically unless something swallows me. Mm. But I'm terrified. So I'm in the middle of the ocean, basically. I just go in the middle of the ocean. I have this gear on, right? Not scuba diving, but just there with, you know, life vests and the rest of the stuff. And, you know, you can see. Yeah, yeah. And I look down in the water. And, man, this is just, it's terror. <laughs> Darkness. And I started realizing, because so, I had to get familiar. It was like, I need to slow down the process, figure out where is this coming from? And I figured out that it, it, was, it was because when I'm looking there, I cannot, one, see everything. And two, I'm in a space where anything could be in here. And I'm having trouble with that because I want so much to be comfortable with the definition of what is in here. And so I went into psychology and I found that this is an actual condition of a specific hemisphere of the brain. Mm -hmm. That that hemisphere of the brain needs to feel like that it has identified everything around it. And that's why we never really use that especially that side of the brain for anything related to our spiritual progress. We had access to this other side of the brain that was used to, you know, it just a voyager, whatever happens out here. It's kind of like the same thing that you see them do as I talk about on Red Bull all the time. They, just, they jump off the mountain. They don't really keep thinking, well, I, this could be my last day. I could die on these slopes. If I scuba dive, my tank could just pop off and a shark could just eat that and my leg. And, you know, all of the extra, you know, because we're now traveling with our minds into all of the things that could go wrong. Yeah. So we would be more of like, well, I can't really die. And surely my day is going to come. But if it's not today, then it's not today. Because when you're, when you're on that, that cusp of the subjective plane, 
you really do witness that when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And when it's not, it's not. I don't care what you think you did and what kind of accident it was and you didn't jump off the cliff. <laughs> and if it wasn't your time, somehow even it would get rewind. You would find yourself on the ground and you'd be like, well, shit, I jumped off the cliff though. I'm supposed to be dead. Right. And you know, you get up and walk on from there. And this was, and they were always playing with this. And that's the thing, they were always bending that threshold to make sure they never became to the point where they didn't realize that that was how things really were. Mm -hmm. Now, another area where this energy also is, is when you do get into some really crazy trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then all of a sudden you gather this godlike force and start powering through whatever that trouble is. Mm -hmm. That particular component was activated in us all the time. That's what kept us non-domesticated, if you may, mm -hmm. and not a people that you can really conquer. Because that whole, well, I guess we're going to die today. <laughs> and I already know I'm going to go on and my answer's already there because I already saw them. And this is the other thing, like if you look at the design of Kemet and you look at any kind of, when you go into these, these, these temples, mm -hmm. the main thing you see, if you really understand geometry and what's happening is you're seeing places where the ancestors are actually still alive. Mm, yeah. And you're even seeing in a person's house, they have places that are configured where when you basically go in that room, you're in there with the ancestors for real. You're not in there with just a statue. I mean, the way the wall is recessed, mm -hmm. the way the light is actually coming in, the certain herbs and elements that are placed in the room, where they're actually placed at, makes this like a real communication center, like your entertainment room, a communication center for you directly genuflecting with your ancestors. So when you're genuflecting with your ancestors all the time, you're not really thinking that there's an end to anything. So you're not like concerned about as much this idea that you can do something or be somewhere and someone can snatch life from you and that you would end up in a horrible place and being tortured and all these kind of things. What this is a product of is that we are for sure in a society, that's why I was saying these horror games and these horror films and these atrocities that we hear from time to time that happen, this is what it's ultimately doing to our consciousness is it's breaking down our level of resolve against, you know, this force of the deep, the death, the darkness, et cetera, which were our forces that we, we have to progressively, well, we don't have to do anything, we get to do it. We get to progressively begin to develop ways in which we can train uh, ourselves to deprogram from that. And as I said before, one of them is, you know, going out in that water. Yeah. You know, nothing's going to kill you out there. You can have a life vest on. You can even get a little knife. <laughs> right. A harpoon gun one day. I was like, okay, let's <laughs> down. I got the Ready. harpoon gun. But if you keep coming back, as with anything, like in Costa Rica, like, as you know, I'm in the jungle. Like, stuff is out here for real, for real. Like, even for me, there's two properties here because I have my, my, my office or whatever in one mm -hmm. area, the studio, and then the, the main house in another area. So I got to walk to the main house every night. So there's no telling what you may see just in the short <laughs> journey from here to the house. So when I first got here, it was funny because there was this spider. And when I first got to Costa Rica, there was a spider running across the floor. And I was staying with some folks too, just, you know, just trying to learn more about the country. And I saw this spider and I was like, man, I, it's kind of like that Martin episode where you feel like this thing is somehow going to jump off the floor, go right at the neck and you're just going to be over right. like, and this is not even realistic, but you know, so I'm yeah, yeah. like that, like, oh, <laughs> And then this old lady, she, this old, you know, uh, Tico lady, she just smashed the thing and, and it was like, okay, <laughs> let me understand here. You're six two. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this is getting to you. Like, what do you expect to happen to you here? So we find that a lot of these fears, like they actually have no actual pretense beside what's going on in our mind. Like we live to fight another day. It's like, if you think of your scariest night, you know what I mean? I've been in houses. That's when I was in Detroit. They got these old houses. Mm -hmm. And spirits are really there. And it's like one <laughs> night in one of these houses. It's like, you, they even have rooms in the house nobody's been to. You know, it's like nowadays we've been to all the rooms in the house. They used to have houses where the room is just nobody's ever been in there ever again for the last 10 years. And it's like, 
you be in one of these houses and it's like a nightmare, especially after a couple Freddy Krueger movies, which we weren't supposed to be watching anyway. Right. And now it develops this huge thing, but the morning comes, nothing mm-hmm. happened, but all of the energy was completely depleted on something that was completely coming from the mind. So that's where we know it also resides. And we also see others that don't have that issue. They don't seem to exhibit these certain levels of fear. Yeah. And then we also see how that opens up the threshold in their life for them being getting to be able to explore and go more places. So to add to that, would you say that the darkness is a connection with black melanated beings? <laughs> you have to take a sip on that one, I guess. <laughs> yeah, because see, the darkness is deep. And I know that we want to relate blackness to darkness and we want to relate that to melanin. But actually, it's more related directly to the netherworld. Okay. And like what happens when. So there's daytime and there's nighttime, right? And, and, and when nighttime starts happening, there's even like a different shift that takes place inside of your body where two different forces, you can say the, the being of the night changes place with the being of the day. Mm-hmm. So w- even when you, when you actually are getting stuck in the transition, it's kind of because you're coming back like after shift change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the energy, which is literally being run by the sun and the, mo- the, the sun predominantly and its cycle moving through, and through the Pantheon, it's like the body and when it shifts energy, it actually allows you to be able to basically make, the, make those uh, transitions on proper time. However, when you enter into the netherworld region of the consciousness, which is the deep where all things are residing, it is, you, you kind of need to be built a certain way to deal with that because it's like the excrement. It's like the congealment. Like what happens is, which is the foundation and the fertilizer for everything else, right? So how this works basically is that kind of what we discard, carbon dioxide and feces, is the fuel for many things in this, in this cycle that we're in. Okay. But if you understand feces, you understand why you can't eat it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's like you've already drained all the energy out of something. You can eat this piece of celery. It's nice and green when it starts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And after it comes out on the other side, it's brown, Mm -hmm. which also is a a certain color that is very telltale of what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. It's got nitrogen in it. So it actually has a a combustible power. Mm -hmm. But for a light body, which is this body, it loves to eat light. It loves to eat all of these these green things. And it loves to eat even plasma and blood. It, it, It feeds on that. Mm-hmm. But the, so the other force, it feeds on our byproduct. Okay. And that's a whole necessary part of this whole process. So if you had a time to have a picnic with the beings that eat the byproduct, mm-hmm. this is going to be kind of awkward if you're not familiar with dealing in that space. And that's what the netherworld really is. It. It's like a space of beings that are primal in respect to how they function and they're more denser. So they're slower Mm -hmm. and there's this density gives the ability for things to grow Mm -hmm. as we talked about before, because in high frequency, nothing can really grow. It's like the the oscillations moving too fast and it just kind of shreds apart things that we're even calling reality thoughts, all that can't move even in high, high frequency. So, that's what's so interesting about this experience and why, as I said before, it's just really about making sure that things are in their proper place. Yeah. Yeah. And when they're in their place, that's why I say the devil's beneath my feet. You know, this was, you know, got to understand what's being said. It's just basically saying that the foundational forces, because we start learning that this devil character actually is a little bit instrumental in creation of the entire thing. And, it's almost just instrumental as the opposing force, the God. Mm-hmm. And so then when we get into a certain level of maturity where we're not always trying to use der- derogatory statements to describe things, yeah. like right now, you know, somebody even, you know, let's use the term, somebody say a nigga, that, that is a derogatory statement for anybody. Yeah. So if you start calling other beings that because you feel like that their position is lower, that is the first way to start an argument or possibly an ass wound. Right. So right. what happened is 
with the netherworld, as I said again, is that they have this horrific description of things, and that's evil distortion. You can't put that in the realm of what the netherworld is. The netherworld is like really gigantic squid, Yamaya, like the old ancestor and ancient beings, mer people. This is what you're talking about, deep Maru. You know, the, the, the ocean, even Saturn's realm is in the ocean, the crystal city, the emerald cities. All of that is all ancient and archaic. Like, that's why nobody is allowed in there. It's not because they don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. It's because they're not allowed there. You can't enter those domains, just like they show you on the movies. You know, the one in Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. They tell you, hey, you can't come up in here. There's a real boundary here. And that boundary is set by the shoreline. Yeah. So this is also, it's not even just, you know, like men there fighting about position. No, these are vast intellects, mm -hmm. macrobes. It's just like this. If you go into the ocean, you may run across a life form that you've never seen before. Large, huge, with a vast intellect. Mm -hmm. And so too, if you go into space, you will run across the same thing. That's mm -hmm. why there is life out there, as you calling it life, but it moves like a gas. Mm -hmm. Because not, when you start going higher, once you break sea level, sea level is the zero, like the balance, like even sea level right where it starts. It starts there specifically for a specific reason. That's why when you go up higher, it's pressure. You go down lower, it's pressure. On the sea level, it's no pressure. Hmm. So then when this pressure starts getting higher, all the elements from up there, you can't really see them. They're actually gaseous. They're for sure there. <laughs> you know, you tone it in the third eye and you, <laughs> you start taking a look when a storm or a weather system come through and you will see the whole force move through and you may be sitting back there terrified and look and the storm will even pass and do nothing to you and you'll be like damn i was just terrified for nothing <laughs> and it's like when you really get out of that zone and start realizing what you're what you're really dealing with it actually starts to open your eyes to more and more of what's going on and so this is why conquering the fears have a lot to do with becoming aware of certain things almost as if the fears are only there as as like time released locks to get you're aware of like your parents used to do mm. whatever they don't want you touching you open that cabinet <laughs> it'll kill you <laughs> there's an axe it's gonna fall but i have to say to get you not to go in there but then when it's time you start braving up to open up that cabinet you see what i mean and then you realize that's where they've been keeping all the alcohol or something so what it is is there is this format that we can always hearken to in life, which is how parenting works, how tr our tribe works. That when we want to answer certain questions, why do I have these fears? You know, especially since I, I don't really want to have them. So they must be there for an actual reason. What is that? Because those are locks there. And now when you're ready to release those locks, you're going to actually start, you know, you ask the question, then you start getting more and more of the awareness. Because one of the things about dealing with the, with, that realm, the underworld, is there, it's a big respect thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's better off not even to know that they're even there and that they even exist if you do not have respect because they don't have that same threshold of letting you say and do anything to them without actually suffering the repercussions. Mm -hmm. See, that's what actually happened to us even as a, as a race of people, if you may, mm -hmm. that when we started making oaths and pacts and dealing with the spirits inside of the water, when we didn't keep some of those oaths and pacts and those promises, it created a debt for us. And I, and I talked a little bit about that and about how there's a spiritual debt mm -hmm. that we're still dealing with because of this consistent, basically conscripting other life forms to do certain things from, for us and then cheating them <laughs> in, by not paying them what it is that we promised them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is rife in the world. It still happens today. And I just want to speak at why there is even another world and why there are things that are down there that are like, they're old, <laughs> there's old stuff, it's decaying, but yet it lives because it's in, we're, we're in an infinite existence. It's just living on that frequency. And I always say many of those things serve to actually let us know where we don't want to be. Mm. They're perfectly fine with who they are and what they're doing. 
You know, you're not gonna, they're not into this. Elements are not into this. I wish I could be. That's our thing. <laughs> Right, right. They're not trying to be something different than you know, Lord of Netherworld too. You see what I mean? Yeah. So it's just like in, in passing it. And that's why we deal with most of the Netherworld when we're asleep. Our dream body is equipped to deal with the Netherworld and to navigate it every night and get us back to the real world. Most of the time unscathed. <laughs> right. Sometimes, right. you know, a crazy situation could jump off in a dream and then you could be up there, wake up in the morning like, I'm so glad that I'm here. <laughs> and once again, this just chimes into what we were saying earlier, getting in control of the dreams is not really just getting in control of the dreams. It's actually getting in control of the afterlife. And mm -hmm. when you start learning how to control your dream, when you quote unquote die, you just go into a dream that you can control and you never have to report back here. There's never the time shift where you got to come back into the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it, it's a very real thing. It's like, it's something that can be accomplished now. It's not one of those things where we got to wait until we're, we're dead to actually experience. Is there an attack or, or an attempt to destroy the divine feminine, the woman, the, the female in your Absolutely. opinion? Absolutely. There's an attack to try to destroy all of us. And, and, um, that, that comes from so many different forces. There's a lot of jealousy. Jealousy is like one of the dirtiest things that, you know, and it lives, even many of us harvest small portions of it. And it, but as a large form, when all of that is collected together, it, it is a very nasty force. I feel like that's God's flaw, mm. being a jealous God. I'm a jealous God. And that's the first time, you know, like I always say, that's when you know you need to get out of the relationship. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm the jealous one. So because they're basically what I'm getting to here is, is that so when you just look at it and see how it really is, you have for thousands of years, all cultures around the world admiring a specific group of people, a specific form of culture, and this culture predominantly taking place in Kemet, and modeling their entire society after it. And this culture was not teaching them to be heathens and to, to destroy everybody. It was teaching them how to become aware of self and how to get yourself prepared for the afterlife. <laughs> and that pissed off people, a certain group of people after a while when they wanted to control things and they found out that because this knowledge about self was embedded everywhere and everybody knew everything about it, the first thing they needed to do was start defacing the people that were actually bringing that knowledge and getting the getting the ideal to how people looked up to them, like even the Greeks, how the Greeks looked up to the Egyptians, to get that ideal changed. So they basically sought to tear down God, as crazy as it sounds. Yeah. They wanted to remove, God was us. The knowledge was teaching that we all were divinity. Mm -hmm. so they attacked God. And in that, they attacked everybody, but they directed that attack at the melanin dominant. And that attack was not uh, just let's march all the troops in there because you were going to get your ass whooped. <laughs> like it was a step-by-step -step process. And I have a whole series about it. I call it Saguni the Jew. And, okay. you know, what India is really about and how it really reveals what happened with Persia and all that power and magic and what Arab Arabic really is as a language and, you know, what a Sharif is and all these different levels of power, like, the last thing you see of it is a thousand and one Arabian nights, just now some just fictitious story. But what was really going on in these places and who was what kind of power was moving through there? And then ultimately what I what I'm basically showing is, is that. Through a series of events, through the weaknesses of, you know, there's there's weaknesses. Everybody has their weaknesses. These yeah. being study weaknesses. Like, that's really what they do. They know, you know, the Indian man's weaknesses, alcohol. Mm. but they bring in a bunch of alcohol that was like when they bought in that alcohol and they like they, that was it you know what i mean they know the poppy seed especially for these these folks these these uh um i guess what you would call machicans mm -hmm. you know the the hispanics as we call them today the latinos right the poppy seed and just how even colombia as a goddess in amazonian amazon and the amazonian goddess that they worship and all that and how she was really a flower and how that flower is what we call today cocaine. 
And so they knew how to, to, to go back into these cultures and actually find the energy, things that we don't even believe in anymore and find that energy and then give the person so much of that energy, they become drunk on that energy. So we see in the collapse of the empires, the rulers are drunk on energy and power and control. And they're kind of like being coerced over a period to take on the different ideals from other cultures. Like, this is how you should rule. And you should do this. This is how you should be. And this, this goes on to today until now, our reputation bears almost no resemblance to who we truly are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And, and that, that's just clear. Like people don't see us now. Like I, if I meet somebody, they may ask me if they can buy some weed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Do I have, you, you got some music that, you know, do I know how to rap? Mm -hmm. And this kind of thing. Like when I meet people, you know, like, there's a lot of tourists that come through and if I'm out, they're like, hey man, you play football? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, so there's this huge, they don't say anymore. So, man, you know, you kept the jet pillar. Did you bring the jet pillar with you? That's not what we're, we're known for. Can you, can you give me the secret to life and how to re, in, reconnect with my, my long dead grandma? That's not what they're coming to us for anymore. So this is, that's, the, that's been that overall process of re-engineering, you know, uh, what is the core ideals for a specific race of people. And, and again, I talked about this before. Why is this so important? It's because Alkibulanians correspond to water. The planet is 70% water. Mm -hmm. And when we're dealing in a negative fire culture, which is what we're in right now, mm -hmm. the only true opposition to fire is water. Mm -hmm. And now wind is coming to try to do something about it because mm -hmm. we're actually going into the, the age of wind. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, you should never fan flames. <laughs> okay, right. Right. And so the people who are in the world that represent wind are actually what we would say now is the Chinese. Mm. The systems of the Orient and the ancient Orient are the wind systems. They're very orderly. They have a lot to do with breath. There's a lot of stuff about nobility and being honorable and all of that stuff. That's the wind. That's how the wind moves. That's all wind personality. Fire people, as we know, our melanin recessives are fire people. They get, they're very clingy. Fire clings to things. It needs to consume something. This is why they're always up in somebody else's culture. It, they don't, fire does not respect boundaries. It will burn your entire house down. It does not respect cultures. It takes things that are very complex and it makes it all the same. Now fire also generates heat. So we're not saying that any of these, any of these elements are innately evil. Any of these people are innately evil, but when they get imbalanced, mm -hmm. When yeah. fire is in balance, when water is in balance, you know, water is like, yeah, we water people. So we love to dance. We love language. We love soul. We love anything to do with spirit, spirituality, singing, tones, vibrations, mysticism. This is us. Anything that moves like a serpent or a snake. And, and that, that's us. The curve, five, that's us. That's water. But water also has a swamp. There's a negative side. When we get stagnant, the swamp is full of vipers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there becomes a trade-off between our key fundamentals, which are in spirituality and sex. So for us as water beings, spiritual, our whole existence is based on spirituality and sex. Yeah. So when we don't know Tantra and we don't know the God within, we're lost. So that's exactly how they went at us is they removed Tantra and they over-sexualized us. And then they put in this Christianity and then boom, that, that's, where, that's how you defeat water. So in the books of these elements, because there became books, it would tell you how to defeat water. Mm. And those books got into their hands because the books will tell you like, when you look at the Chinese books, when they have books that are even shaped like pentagrams and they show you how all these elements move into each other and how in every single different form of nature, how one can dissolve or ignite the other and that was chem that was real chemistry mm -hmm. so of course it chemistry was going on in chem at first and so there was maximum awareness of how these elements played together and you became an alchemist mm -hmm. by knowing how those elements work together yeah yeah they decide they're going to create hermetics like a spinoff where they restylize and change the language and begin to use this same power because it is the as above, well, so below power. So you can take that same knowledge and while it makes something explode, 
it'll also make a person explode and a culture explode. It just needs to be applied with the same formula. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is where we're at with the power. And, you know, this is why, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this situation together. And we now need to fess up to, you know, our role as teachers. Okay, so here's the whole thing. I'll end it for you right here. It'll all make perfect sense because I don't want to play the blame game here. <laughs> See, so notice how still at this point, we are being used as the people to teach the world some very stupid things whether it's through the music, whether it's through rap, whatever it is, we're being used as instruments to teach everybody, the little Indian kids, they over there talking about it, the Singapore girls, they're over there talking about it, they over there in Dubai talking about it and doing it because we are the teachers. Yeah. So now that we're, what, well, what are we teaching? Now we see what we're teaching, right? Overall. So when we move back into the space of realizing how the world is really responding mm -hmm. to what we teach, then we can get our power back. Because then even if some of these people that have some say so that are still, let's say the stars and the actors are the ones who have some say so and some sway, some of them may even be melanin dominant. Mm -hmm. If they start to teach knowledge all of a sudden, like even the dude, they got one dude, you know, he's got the face all tatted up, neck all tatted up, you know, he's one of these new young cats. It's a lot of those. <laughs> he said a couple conscious words. Now everybody, like now they, now 100,000 kids are now playing like they're conscious because this guy, man, I was sleeping. I saw this thing in my yard and we tried, we really got. And just that alone already got them like, yeah, we got. So this is dangerous in their world. They're like, Oh my goodness, if they start becoming teachers again and start really knowing what they're talking about, because it's all fun to play with, but you need to know what else, you know, we're not just gods, we're also devils. <laughs> if you don't really understand how to control your energy properly, we're both things. And that's what the knowledge really starts teaching us. You gotta go to the netherworld because you gotta set things straight. Like there are parts of our body that we have to constantly clean and refresh. That's why the gods of the netherworld, as I said before, they're the ones that come through and they, they're not here for play play. They're like janitor, sewage janitors. They don't want to be sitting here playing with you. Right. So we also have to be able to take that role in our own life and say, I need to go in here. That's why cleanses are never like, la -da -da -da, I'm on the 40 day cleanse. <laughs> you be in there all sucked up like, no more days. because this is like the forced punishment forced pain in order to benefit from that bitter medicine right yeah and so that's what it is i feel like even as a species we're benefiting from the bitter medicine like yeah. we're seeing how maximum cosmic power can be turned into nothing almost you know and, and be seen as the inkling of what it once was to rise all the way back again to its true role and position that we have as leaders and so it is still our fault. Yeah. <laughs> That's the interesting part about the whole thing. It is actually still our fault because as, as being so powerful, we can actually really change this. Yeah. You know, when we start really like, if it clicks on, and I believe it's going to click on, but I'm also not naive either. I know some have died and it didn't click on for them. So I'm not going to be sitting up here and trying to dream about some promise that everybody is all of a sudden going to do in this little short 72 year lifespan, which is like a drop in the ocean as always going to all change right now. I'm going to get a chance to live and witness it, but I'm going to do my best to actually make sure that I go through that process. And as many people that want to, you know, take some advice from what I'm experiencing and do the same thing. This is really, you know, what I, what I bolted onto this journey right now. And so there's a lot of things to consider about, you know, if you really think about how many different things have taken place, even in the nucleus that we don't know about, there's mm -hmm. stuff that goes on in your house that nobody will never know. There's things that you've done that nobody has ever even seen and will never be able to recall. So there's so many micro things happening in the fiber of the reality for us to even think that we can even interpret every single thing that's happening here and know where things are going. That's a little bit silly. The only thing that we can really do, though, is actually calibrate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because when we calibrate ourselves, we have all of the components that are necessary to bolt in directly to this reality and to begin to control it. And that's why we're made up from these five elements. That's why we do have five fingers. Now, you got four elements and then the fifth, which is aether. 
it really makes us still stand above the elements. That's the whole thing with human beings. It just pisses the elements off sometimes. If they had personalities, which some act like they do, there is sometimes a conflict because we possess one extra element that gives us this ability to say, I'm not going to be water today. I'm not going to be fire today. I'm going to be kind of all of the elements today, or I'm going to be like only one element today. And, and they don't have that, what we could call choice. Mm. You see what I mean? So notice how there starts to become this contention point, as they mentioned in some of these ancient books about beings that somehow have this choice. And then these other beings don't. And they're kind of pissed off about why they don't have that kind of floating point. And they start becoming somewhat antagonist or test against us. Mm -hmm. So the elements test us. The elements are the one actually is convincing us that the reality is real. Yeah. In that respect. Now, I don't want to go over what I was saying earlier about the illusion, but I'm saying that the elements are what are putting the construct exactly around us. What we're even standing, that's Earth. Earth has a specific personality. You can even call upon Earth. Earth will show up. Hmm. Fire is everywhere for real. It's just looking for something to combust up in this joker. <laughs> Wind is always moving through this space, even if it's rolling through my own body like a yawn. Mm -hmm. Like even spirits, they move in yawns. Like somebody yawn and the spirit will jump from that person, that person and yawn and it'll jump over that person. Be, and when you see all this going on, you'll be like, you know what? I don't even think we have really the dynamics to start interpreting at this point what's really happening because we have a, a Western curriculum to actually go by. We don't have knowledge from alchemists explaining to us how you can actually distill certain spirits from a plant and be literally looking at the spirit inside of a, inside of a, a, a vial. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And then go to sleep, put the thing on top on your chest and literally start going through a form of communication with this vial of glass of spirit essence that has come off of a plant. And so it's just like, this is, this is what was going on. And then now here it is, time out, and trying to explain anybody that is not really tapped into it themselves that, hey, this is how things really work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's why I, I try not to personally get into that hole that everybody else has to, uh, to, has to comprehend it for me to believe it. Like I need to actually had already experienced it, seen that it was going on, and then I'll come back and tell everybody else, but some will take it as like science. And I can still sit here and have a conversation. And I think that that's where people were, they, they just like, well, I'm screwed. If you was on another world. And so you're telling me you go to another world and you come back and get on the microphone. Yes. <laughs> it's crazy as it sounds. Yes. I just know it's a, I don't know why either. Let me put it that way. Like, yes. And I think that if you're doing those kind of things and all of a sudden the light is over and it kind of just kind of, the curtain comes up like, ta-da, look, you figured it out, you figured it out. But no, it go on. And then you realize also that even from what you've experienced, you're only scratching the surface. Like your experience, as still as it may have been, yeah. that's only the surface. And you, when you get into some type of meditations, especially on the right days, there is certain things about certain days, or as I said, certain substances. And then you're in a whole nother field that is so serious. You don't want to move. You don't want to say anything. You're actually really what we would call afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's yeah. the other thing about, that's why, you know, again, to speak to that, you can bend your threshold of fear. Yeah. It was like me. Now, when the big spiders come by, there's even certain spiders I may just pick up and put back outside. In the beginning, there's definitely not. I'm, <laughs> right? So yeah. as you start dealing with it more, because, you know, the spiders are not going anywhere out here. So as you see the spider everywhere, and you start realizing maybe you do a little study, you do a little research, you figure out this spider is not even poisonous. Mm -hmm. You even watch certain videos, the guy's got the spider all on his damn face. So now, you know, as that part, as you keep going through it, you get more and more comfortable. Yeah. And then this is actually what moves the fear away. And so that's really what happens is that we get more comfortable with dealing with foreign spaces by challenging ourselves with kind of like the next form of uncomfortable presence so we can kind of get comfortable in it and then we're like man i'm definitely changed from how i used to be i used to be kind of scared of everything out here <laughs> and then now that list is, is you know it's starting to dwindle down mm -hmm. yeah nice. i i am just overflowed <laughs> this is this is what i <laughs> anticipated i have two more questions so i don't want to you know take up the remainder of your evening but antarctica mm -hmm. at the source 
there is a project that recorded that in the end of all of the experimentation taking place in Nazi Germany when they went into the heavy levels of paranormal research because they figured out it was all there. Yeah. Madame Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, all these people were all together. And once they got in, Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner actually taught Hitler things. And so once they figured out that they just needed to basically do what the Tibetans were doing, because that's the books that they ended up getting. And that's why they end up kind of taking over that whole thing. Yeah. Their work said that the ultimate goal was Ubermensch. And Ubermensch meant to overcome. And there was a process of Ubermensch to basically make a trek from where you were to the north. And that if you could weather that as a soul, you would make it into a place which became their mythical Hyperborea, in a place in which the parents lived. Now, did they do like they always seem to do and take something literally that is internal and try to find the external version? Because make no mistake, the external version will be there. And that's what they found out is that it is as above, so below. If that there is truly in the Northern hemisphere of the consciousness an exit, there should also be one terrestrial exit at the Northern Pole. So as things hold, I believe personally, absolutely, if you can get into that space, which many say that you cannot, right. that this is the entry point into what we would see as like the womb. Now they say there's also other entry points as you study the Arab tradition a lot, they get into that it's not really at the North only. There are these opening points in the top of the head, in the bottom of the feet, and at the navel, and definitely on the delta. And so, as I mentioned, the delta is actually sitting right there where Nubia is. It's actually a triangle. It is a door. Delta means door in the ancient language. It is also a cognate of the female vagina. And at this particular place is where we come forth by day. Basically that this is the direct opening, which they say that one of the pyramids inverted part of the pyramid is underneath that point. Mm -hmm. And that this point is like a vacuum, a literal vortex or a womb point where souls light get kind of sucked in to a black hole and then get layered and regurgitated from that point. And it was operative. Now, is it operative now? Mm -hmm. Do we still see souls passing from that place? That's another level of research that gets you into ley lines. It starts letting you know why churches are on ley lines most of the time and why there are ancient meeting halls and why there was always a place where the spirits meet. Because when they're moving, because they move like water underground and many of them move in straight lines, they always follow like a specific highway and there's conjunction points on that highway and all the souls meet. Mm -hmm. And so there was basically that, that's like understanding, um, let's say the body of Gaia in all of her, her, her mysteries, which is they, they love to say that nobody knows all of her mysteries because she has, you know, so many different levels of, of her existence. The deep, which is water, the net world, the subconscious mind, the depth of the womb, the opening points, which are portals, her courtships, because also the earth is a court. She, she courts all these different beings that you're seeing here, their daddy and mama, if you may, you're in a relationship with earth. So this means that we actually have from earth direct access into other realms and other spaces where primal forms actually exist that are cognates of things like you would see as a lion, the snakes, the bird, basically the animals on the crown of the magi. Because within those animals, all other animals on the surface come from those four animals. And then again, these are schools and systems because even when you get to the ocean, the ocean has a whole nother set of tools and animals and you know, uh, forms to learn from. And, um, and so it, it's again, a great that we're going through this process of realizing how detrimental it is for us not to judge because then we judge ourselves and we start observing the experience a bit more and start getting our feet wet with our power. Mm -hmm. We stop creating enemies for ourselves. Even, you know, we're just creating a lot of in, in, enemy kind of forces inside of our own minds, even if we're not even like seeing these beings or talking to them every day. 
And this is kind of a misuse of, of our own power because we're kind of making our own power conflict with itself when truly we just need to make sure everything's in its proper place. And so that's what I have to say about the North Pole is, is that there is an ultimate reference to the North Pole here and, you know, just that process of bringing up the Kundalini and actually getting it there mm -hmm. and, and then being able to let it go back over and then it slips down that part that's in the back of your nose and then it drips down into the mouth from the roof mm -hmm. of the mouth right onto the tongue and it has like a sweet taste. Then it goes down the throat and then down here and it drops like it's made out of something else. Like it's just slipping through everything and it drops all the way down. It goes into and it sits into the dantain. And then it can recycle itself back up again. And, and this is like this, this perpetual system that the body is, it has. And, but for a person, because many people have, have, even if they claim to have not tapped into that, because that actually is a very, very orgasmic, loving, non-conflictive in that way kind of being. Like this being just washes, washes you over with pleasure. So it doesn't really even matter like where you're coming from, what you're about, what you're doing, what you think, what you believe. You can't really resist the level of, of power and force that is coming off of them that is like attracting you and embracing you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there, you know, those kind of forces, those are like the goddess forces that and because that, that's why it takes that force, even within a male, a male can't even activate that unless he's activated the divine feminine in itself. A female cannot activate that unless she's activated the divine masculine in herself. And this is where, you know, there, there is the ultimate confusion there is that when we see ourselves as males and females, we often even see the woman and we think that only the woman is the actual universal mother. Right. The universal mother is actually a combination of woman and man as we know them. Mm -hmm. There's a reference directly to the divine androgen and that's who Aphrodite is. That's who her, her, Hermes actually was a cognate of is a hermetic being a hermaphrodite. And so the, it, there's a strong awareness in the ancient culture that the original form, which was here, the great parent, if you may, was an hermaphrodite and actually could procreate from itself. Because just as we see happening still sometimes today, beings were born with both genders intact and could procreate with themselves externally and keep creating more external forms. And, you know, and that being the origin and the level that they were at with their power, because basically their system. is come again by inviting the divine feminine masculine back in our lives and actually balancing that out internally and figuring out how that works in the breath and the chakras and then collapsing them all back together they were born like that and because of that their level of power and interaction they they were illustrious to us they became our instructors they were our parents mm -hmm. and that was in its truest context the real gods they were our parents and then we tried to become like the gods by figuring out how to merge our sides back together again. And they thought that it would be excellent to throw us into an experience where we would actually be separate and need to figure that out on an external level because we begin to learn from each other through each other. And as I said, one taking on this idea of being an explorer and then the other one being what's explored. And, you know, and, and that magnificent journey unfolding. And so for thousands of years, probably countless periods, that's just what you had beings doing, diving in and out of the experiences, coming to the awareness of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, like I said, you know, time comes where that knowledge and that information starts falling into other hands and starts becoming used for other things. And, you know, it kind of takes stuff off of course. Nice. Uh, you know, there's your yeah. metaphorical and physical <laughs> North Pole. Yeah, yeah, and I know it goes much deeper than that, but <laughs> that it was, does. oh my gosh. Um, you hear me? Yeah, I can. What the? I don't it, know. It just went out. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed to pause for a quick second, but you know, it oh picked back up, so it's still going. Oh I hope it's still recorded. Oh my god! Yeah, it is. I can see the recording in the top left corner. All right, I, I do, use out. Zoom a lot, okay. so I hope you got the gist of that question. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, I did. I did. I think I got the gist of it, and, and it was basically, you know, what are we, you know, what are we doing now, especially in relation to, you know, how we're going to be able to connect and find yeah. others that are actually in tune with where we're at. Yeah. And these are the direct kind of things that I can go at because these are things that don't require me to boot up <laughs> the, the metaphysical engine in order to actually solve. It actually says, hey, why don't you go and create that? And, you know, make that more because I, I also believe that there is this conscious thing going on, but it's not really also what I'm trying to go with it. 
because it's almost like it's just kind of playing with it. And so because I take my spirituality very serious, it was imperative for me to create a space that you could find others that are actually just that serious about what they're, what they're involved in with this. And that's why we put ambassador training together. And to be honest, like even one of our sisters came in, you know, and she has a strong YouTube following. It's about 300,000 people on her channel. She's been delivering the message. And she came in and she just thoroughly enjoyed the space because she was saying, it's just that, that, you know, when you're teaching everyone all the time, you know, it's great to be able to come into a place, learn something, but also share what you have. And even what you may not be able to deliver to everybody else because you know that they're at a certain level of awareness and they're not even aware, ready for that. You can lose your whole fan base overnight by making a quick switch on what you think things are like, right? Yes, and yes. so there's got to be a place that we're able to come to that we can actually continue this process that's so instrumental to us, which is we charge off of each other. Yeah, yeah. Like it's a real thing that when I, when I see someone that I'm excited about and the whole attraction thing, it's like energy just comes all over the place and it really makes you feel like you want to do something. Now, I always talk about this in, re <laughs> in reference to relationships because when you meet somebody that you really like, boy, it's like you back at the gym. You know what I mean? You now, you know, it's wow to watch this person. I used to watch myself like that. I'm like, man, look at you, man. This is weird. Like, why can't you do this all the time? Like, what's up with you? And there is a part of us, though, that we need this connection. I see, because they try to, and I talked about this, they try to flip you out and say, and that's your problem. This is the whole Buddhist male approach, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's your problem. You need to learn how to be by yourself and you need to learn how to, to get rid of all your desires and pleasures at once. And there's a lot of truth to that, but there's, it's a paradox here. So this yeah. truth has like a double-edged sword over here. There's another side to that and that's, but you breathe in and you breathe out. So you do, yeah, need to get off to yourself at some point and actually begin to recharge and collect who you truly are and make sure you're not getting overwritten by somebody else's identity. But on the same token, you have to be able to come back into this, this joy and this pleasure that we all share in our connection, especially in real time. Stuff's happening right now. I need to really know, you know, where my folks at. Like, I need, I need to, to create more of my life because think about this. Like, if the whole goal is in life is for you to create your whole world, who is going to be a part of that world? Yeah. And everybody can't. So lose this idea that every single person, like if you have 45,000 friends, none of them would be real friends because there's no way you're going to spend time with 45,000 people. So you do have to choose. Well, so what group of people am I going to actually be with and enjoy my life with? And I also feel like a lot of us don't really have people that we've grown up with for years. Like, oh, I've been knowing him since we were eight. And we don't have a lot of that going on because we've been routed a lot, you know, due to this system. So that means that we need to at least find a place where we can start the process of spending time with somebody else and really beginning to allow them to grow on us. Like, it's like, it's really like a ship. How this worked in the past is, is that everything functioned pretty much like a ship. If I go out on this ship with you, I may save your life out there. You may save my life. And we may brave a few storms together. And in this process, we start really depending on each other and we develop this bond. And so then that really is what makes it, you know, you, we may get to a bar and I'm just using a metaphor, metaphor here. We may get to a bar and you may start arguing with somebody and I'm on your side because you saved me when I was about to die. I don't even care if you're wrong then. So what I'm saying is that there's a bond that's created over time when people go through certain kind of experiences with each other and often question if it was even possible for people to go through those kind of experiences virtually, you know what I mean? Because there's a huge question there. How would that work? And what I've come to realize is that it's a fine blend between, again, what we've created now, even if you log in, you'll see who's around you mm -hmm. and, you know, and shooting them a message, especially as things come online more, like they're going to come online more in this next two weeks because we're launching Enneology. As I said, it's free well, and it's so really Seven, let me chime in. I did join. The one thing I wanted to ask, it asks about my location and sharing my location. I got a little hesitant about that. So what can you tell me about that? I, I could definitely, you know, see where it's like, okay, I don't want nobody to know exactly where I'm at. But what we do is we just, we just use the city okay. and the state. Got and it. so we do have a way of saying, hey, this person is like four miles away okay. or 10 miles away but nobody knows where that is. 
Got and it. at the end of the day, I, you know, you can always turn it off, but I thought about how, especially as stuff is really starting to pop off. Mm -hmm. And one thing about secret energy that is different than a lot of the other platforms, it's like everybody there, because it's still like relatively small compared to how big some of these platforms are. Mm -hmm. There's a real consensus amongst us. Mm -hmm. There's only like a 5% that seem to be on some destroy deviant mission. <laughs> Other 95% are really on the level and are actually here because of residents. Everybody else kind of got shook off. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it more of a higher probability that you're actually going to run into someone that is really integral and has some ideals. And I think so, some, some real core ideals and fundamentals that actually allow them to be great beings. And that is a product of, I would say, myself. Mm -hmm. If I get on there and I start talking about all sorts of stuff, I'm bringing in lots of conspiracies and wild stuff, we're gonna attract that kind of person into the space. Mm -hmm. If we're not doing that, we're gonna repel those kind of people because they love that kind of stuff. So they're gonna try to find that somewhere and they're gonna overlook this. So it's been the message itself and the core of that message and how it's really been able to tap into people that has allowed the people that are there to even be there. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that is, that is a real design for us. Yeah. And this is what allows that kind of resonance to be there. And then beyond that, beyond what happens on the website, as I said before, ambassador training, you may want to come in a month. I can hook you up on something like that, just so you can dip your feet in and see it. Yeah. And then also the materials that are there. It's not just, <clears throat> we found that the connection part is a key fundamental portion of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. We found that the connection part is, is, is key. It's big to just have someone there that you can connect with and resonate with. But that's also not it either by yeah. itself yeah. because we need to be growing and you can find some people they'd be in there all you know, like three three hours it's like what are we doing here did you have something to read or whatever right. so we wanted to create a space where also you were still growing mm -hmm. and that's why those materials there they're like we were supposed to do an university uh three mm -hmm. we went to university two university uh, university one university two and then with university three i was like you know what i don't even have time to do a whole nother you know, go around of all this knowledge at its higher level, I'm just going to create something and I'm going to put it all there. And that became ambassador training. Yeah. So the materials that are actually there, which is like a composition of still two, two and a half years of stuff that's not on YouTube, not on Facebook. Because the other thing is, is that when I'm on YouTube and I'm on Facebook, there are things that when I'm literally saying them, I'm like, yeah, don't say too much of that mm -hmm. because you're on these open lines and these people yeah. are listening and you got a, you're also got a random group. You don't know who is tapping into this particular phone call. So there has to be some kind of accountability mm -hmm. to what you're actually saying and what you're allowing others to, to hear from you. Right. So in university or in, excuse me, in, in, uh, in, in ambassador training, that doesn't exist there because it's a private space and you're not even supposed to be in there if you're not already recognizing that this is a private space and you have to hold to the rules of it being a private space. So that means everybody comes in there like we're really family. We say what we need to say. Some folks have went through transitions. At one point they may have been like even another sex and oh. decide to go back to the original sex they were. You get, okay. and then be candid about explaining that and other folks will be like, okay, we cool. And I know you were gonna <laughs> say, but since we already cool, fucking cool. great. I'm glad you're <laughs> seeing more clarity with yourself. So it does still become that space where you can go a little bit more deeper rather than keep bringing the curated character. Yeah. Because that's another thing. Like when you're around a lot of people and you think everybody's on this spiritual thing and now I gotta come in at least after a 60 day fast, that's not where I wanna be either. So what we are is what we create. And I have come to this certain level of balance to where when we come in the space and there's other pillars there that are on that same synchronistic journey, they create the space of balance. So what does that do? It makes it so individuals such as me and you, when we need to be somewhere and feel like that we need that level of connection, we actually get it. And it's not just virtual because many folks, I'll be watching so I look at the background, I'm like, wait a minute. So you're in Chicago now? And so you see people, they're always moving around. They're like, they're only if even sometimes a state away. It's like, hey, I'm gonna go drive down and, and see John this weekend. And then they'll take pictures, boom, look, tribe here, tribe vibes. And so <laughs> we're creating something and everyone knows that you kind of have this thing where it's like, it's, it's a consensus. It's like, because we all went through this knowledge and information and we are vibing with it, we're like different kind of beings. It actually changed us. You don't get somebody so far off the fringe and it's like, 
they don't stick around long. They just can't stick to it. And that's what residence is. So rather than me, because we do have certain policies in place that help protect the space, but rather than me trying to like be this micromanager over everything, mm -hmm. I did it a different way by actually leading by example and allowing certain energies to, to really thrive in the space while removing certain kind of energies from the space altogether. Got and it. so it removes that whole competitive, you know, it's WWE, let's see who's smarter. <laughs> you know, somebody <laughs> want to steal the frame and talk for two hours, you know, so all of that, <laughs> it's been mitigated because we're all in there just having a good time and connection with each other when we're doing that. Nice. And then when it's time also to keep deep diving, because like I said, with that, those nine letters of the sky, that wasn't like once you were done, you were just done. Right. Like even I'm still, I'm still digesting. I taught the class. <laughs> and I'm still digesting what came through. And that's also the power of the co-creation. Mm -hmm. Because when you come into a space, you actually become almost like a channel and a conduit for others who have a certain level of power, but their power is not expression. Mm -hmm. So they are able to use you then in that expression. And because you're synchron synchronously going through that same experience, you find that, you know, it just all melds in perfectly. And then also the ability to keep growing. We give you something that you can go in whatever you're doing. If you're a coach, if you're doing whatever, having these tools, having etiology, et cetera, you're going to excel over there with them. They're going to be like, oh man, you calling me out. You know everything. And so that is basically open source in itself. You can use that on whatever you're doing and whoever you're doing it with. And then also if you're in that process of development where you want to do something, like I want to lead yoga, I want to do meditations and you are not familiar with doing that around other people, which is a whole process that you've learned, even just being able to sit around people and not be completely fawning over who they are and actually get the questions out is quite a technique, right? right. So there has, there has to be a space where someone learns that. Like you learned it because your personality is that way. You got other, other people, they want to do it, but for some reason or another and things that have happened to them in life, they, they never got a chance to develop that. This is the place where you can come in on Wednesday and you can try it out on us. And if it sucks, we're going to even tell you, but in a nice way, but you at least get through that whole process of what it's even like to be there in front of people that are actually listening to you yeah. and are ready to absorb whatever it is that you have to bring. So, and no cult like crazy and hearing like all the extra stuff that has been going on also in the communities because there is some wild stuff going on. All of that is removed completely. It's like, we are that space where we, we refuse to lose that way. Nice. You know what I mean? It's like, there's got to be at least one space where that's not going on. Yes. And, and to <laughs> oh me, God. this is it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'm glad you cleared it up for me. I am going to finish out because I'm excited about being a part of it. I mean, oh my gosh. Um, I just, that was just that one little thing. I'm like, hmm, my location. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for yeah. clearing that up. And lastly, um, as we close out, I'm into talking to people about the cryptocurrency and building wealth outside of the dollar. Um, can yes. you talk a little bit about that and, and just give our people information on where they, think, where they can go and what they can do regarding the currency? For sure. As you know, you know, I went in today. I had to listen to it you again did. on the <laughs> Economic Forum. You did. I was hooked for about an hour and <laughs> I realized that, you know, I need to go off and do some other stuff today. But just meaning that, it was an accomplishment because the transmission came through and I felt like it was clear enough for those that were listening to understand how imperative it is right now to really get control of the finances and start utilizing the instruments that are available. And, you know, just to make a very longer, long story short that there is a new form of transaction and currency here and it does really put you in the driver's seat from just to be blunt, it makes you the bank. Mm. And even back in the day, the idea of becoming a bank seemed very fictitious. Like if somebody said, hey, you can be a bank, it was like, man, come on. We have <laughs> such a big idea of what we think banks really are, but we just don't understand the technology. Mm -hmm. And what cryptocurrency is, is it's that exact technology. And then it allows you to actually begin to take your wealth and to place it into something different and actually allow it to not even be tampered with uh, especially as we keep going in the future. And it can even become impervious to things like the up and down that often happens with currencies or if we're expecting a currency to crash. Mm -hmm. And so there is a huge situation that's happening that because there's a certain level of a learning curve 
uh, with understanding how to be your own bank. We and also there is um, a bit of opposition. You disappeared, oh, Seven. My camera went off. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> man, getting that thing to come back on right now, that means the battery went down. Oh, no worries. Uh, I guess I'll, you know, dial out just so everybody can go into the meditation. <laughs> so, uh, just I'll, I'll close down by saying there's a, f there's a huge level of opposition out there right now that is trying to keep people from realizing exactly how much money uh, that they can make and, and, and how they can sustain their lives by getting involved in, in this. So it's not just being able to put your currency somewhere where it's secure. It's also being able to put your currency someplace that it will grow. Got it. And so this is a huge opportunity that is available to us right now. I'd like to personally welcome everyone to just get educated about the space. That's why I actually recommend WealthyBot because it's not just something that you, you can use. Uh, and that's WealthyBot.io. It's something that you can join the group and you can go through. I wrote a book. I, it's, it's called the Cryptocurrency Bible. Mm -hmm. And for the beginner, and it's obviously free, it's for the beginner, you learn everything about the terminology. What is a hard wallet? What is all this stuff? Mm -hmm. How do you even buy cryptocurrency in the first place? What are these numbers? So the things that if I had known, I'd be a millionaire right now because I had the opportunity to buy the cryptocurrencies very early on. And I started to even as a computer person to buy some. Okay. And I got on like step three and I was like, I'm not doing this today. Mm -hmm. And I never went back. And literally that was a million dollar blow because I was actually going to buy like two or 3000 that two or $3,000 would have been worth at least 1.2 to $1.3 million right now. Oh my God. So, and even just yesterday, because we constantly know stuff that's happening in the cryptocurrency market. There was a move I was supposed to wait, make. I kind of got a little hung up on some other things and I missed a 40% turn on profit. That means if I had put 10,000 in, it would have came back with 14,000. And, and it was, it's just that easy. That, and that, that would have been literally in a three-day period. Wow. So, of course, if we're just learning about this kind of stuff, uh, which is kind of what I felt like when the whole market's turned upside down, is because everybody had learned about it and it was starting to get now everywhere. And then they were like, okay, we need, to, we need to hide this again. And so right now the markets are back. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is already at around $11,000. Okay. But it's still more because a lot of people, a lot of people lost money. They're like, oh, I knew it was a scam. I'm staying away from it. And that's exactly the objective that they wanted to accomplish. So yeah. we welcome people to come back in, get educated about the space at least, buy your first cryptocurrency just so you know how it works. Uh, because I think also you do need a little bit of, you takes money to make money. Yeah. So at least you kind of know if I'm making some money, this is where it can go. And it gets us more familiar with investing money and seeing the, the profit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the, the, the market is so volatile if you may that if you just wait it even even if you come into a position and in that position is starting to go into the negatives you just wait in a couple more months and the position is back into the profits and into the positive and so it just starts getting you familiar with what i feel like is the psychological aspects of being able to take control of your sovereignty nice well, Seven, yeah. I appreciate you so much. Even though you went into darkness, we, we yeah, still like I faded the to best. black on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a way to go. But you know what? The message is received. And but I thank you so much for sharing the space. I'm going to include your links at the bottom so that everyone knows where to go to um, further, you know, get this this knowledge and, and get a part of this new currency and so forth. And I have more questions for you, but I'll, I'll reach out to you aside from this. But I just want to thank you again for just giving me this this time and space. It's so greatly appreciated. And absolutely, uh, sis, you know, maybe we can come forward in the future and, you know, just speak specifically on, you yeah. know, these kind of economics. And as you know, we're rolling out some stuff and things are already going to be showing themselves for what they are. We have proof. So we can yes. come back in at another point and, you know, yeah. just do kind of like a one-on-one. Sure. Um, it's nothing, no harm in doing that and just kind of take it from scratch on what it is, how it works and how a person can get involved. I love it and I welcome it and I honor it and I thank you so much again. Um, I thank you all for tuning in once again. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Kula Bay. Remember, we continue to grow by staying in the flow of love and light. Peace and blessings. Wholeness.